now the transition between Yom Kippur and Sukkot. Regarding this period of time, these five days, that we know that Hashem gives us special koach to perform the special mitzvahs that we need to do, finding a proper law of the Nesrog, being able to build a beautiful sukkah, preparing the arkelim for the Yom Tov, cooking, inviting, cleaning, preparing, everything that's involved to have a, a beautiful Simchas Yom Tov. There is a curious Rama in Shulchan Aruch, Simen Tov Reish Chof Hey, that seems to, uh, uh, tough dalid, that seems to contradict something that he says in the very next simon. The previous simon is in the laws of Yom Kippur, tough reish chaf dalid, and it says as follows: It's a medaktikim, people who are really careful with mitzvos. Matchilim miyad b'motzei Yom Kippur in basias sasuka. They go from Yom Kippur davening, I guess after Kiddush Levana, and they start to work on their sukkah. K'day latzeis mi mitzvah el mitzvah, to go from one mitzvah to the next. Which is an interesting formulation. We don't find that very often, and we could ask, why is this unique to sukkahs? And maybe any mitzvah, it's good to go from mitzvah el mitzvah, but here it's singled out by the Maharil, who is the basic posek a thousand years ago. Um, for for Ashkenazic Jewry. Uh, actually, sorry, he's in the more in the 16th and 17th century. But it, he is one of the building blocks of the of the tradition of the Ashkenazic halacha. And that's what he says. And, the, and also, it's uh, quoted by the Hagais Maminus in his commentary the, uh, on the Rambam, Perak Beis. So this seems to be a message that you should try, you should go as quickly as possible from Yom Kippur to the mitzvahs, the mitzvahs of Yom Kippur to the mitzvahs of Sukkah. But then, as we transition into Hilcha Sukkah itself, in Simen Tov Reish Chavhei, the Ramah writes the following gloss. He says, B'sukkah Steishvu, this is the Mecha Be'er Shivas Yomim, you're supposed to sit in the Sukkah for seven days, why? He takes the opinion, it's a machlokas, where Bekiva says sukkas mamish, but <clears throat> we adopt the halacha, uh, the other opinion, that these are actually the uh, resemble the clouds of glory, and that you have to actually think about that when you enter the sukkah, that you are under some sort of special protection of Hashem in a group sense and will not allow us to be struck by the heat and by the blazing sun, um, which can get pretty strong here in Eretz Yisrael if you don't prepare properly. Then adds the Ramah curious comment. We should do the mitzvah of the sukkah right after Yom Kippur. The mitzvah habal yadeno al yach mitzeno. Because when a mitzvah comes to your hand, you shouldn't let it become chametz. In other words, don't let those 18 minutes pass. Try to do it as quickly as possible. Quoting also the same Hosek the Maharil. What's going on over here? Why is the Maharil telling us two different messages? And the Ramah is accepting both the halacha. You told us already that you're supposed to go from Yom Kippur to Sukkot because to go from one mitzvah to the next. Why do you have to repeat a different concept called the Takein Sukkah Miyad Lacha Yom Kippurim the Mitzvah Habali Adeno Al Tach Mitzena for a different alternative concept that we should not miss. We should not be, how shall I say, be remiss and um, bungle an opportunity to do a mitzvah in a way which is pure and not, so to speak, supposed to be chametzdik, chametzdik being the reference to the Yitzhahara, we got a little lazy, we got a little hungry, we got a little distracted, whatever it might be, we should focus and do the mitzvah with alacrity. Why these two reminders for the same concept? In order to explain this, we have to go deeper into the fundamental uh, observances of sukkah itself. We know 
that the mitzvahs we will do in the transition period between Yom Kippur and Sukkot are primarily two. One is procuring the Dalad Minim, Lulu ben Esro, and the other one is preparing the Sukkah, Mitzvah Yeshiva Sukkah. It's curious to note that the Veltanshan, the, the general um, spirit of these two mitzvahs seem to be diametrically opposed to each other. Let me explain. When it comes to picking an Esro, people will study the halachos and spend hours and hours inspecting the top of, a, of an Esro to see whether it's pitam, has not been damaged or removed, whether a black dot may appear on the first shlish, the top third of the of the esrog, that it's not split, that it's not missing anything, that it wasn't it wasn't pierced. I've gone to um, collect my own esrog game in a shemitah year from nearby yishuv, and I can tell you that there are serious thorns that grow on an esrog tree that actually do pierce the fruit. So it's not a it's not an uh, a uncommon occurrence. Those those don't make it to the market, but it's pretty pretty common. So we look for every imperfection, something chaser, something that's not something that's missing, something that's not hadar. It's not beautiful. We look for a beautiful gidel. We want to have a beautiful shape. In fact, some look for agartol. What agartol means is that they tied something around the fruit as it was growing, and esrog has a unique property that it can actually grow a like if it's got a tight waisted belt, it can actually grow around it so that it looks like it has a belt, like a Hasidic um, gartel that is worn to separate the upper and lower halves of the body for tefillah, which of course is halacha you need to do, but not necessarily using a gartel. The clothing is, uh, is adequate. But um, there's, and we look at our lulavs, we look at the top of the lulav, we look for closed lulav, we're terrified that there's the most simple split in the lulav itself. And we, and we look for mishulashim, we look for hadasim that are triple, and that it's on one line, and there's no distance between the two and the and the third one. And we have to have a certain measure. It's very, very stressful, if you care, to find the right appropriate dalad meaning with all the, the kashras and all of the hindurim You've got to work hard unless you have somebody you're paying to do it for you, but that might be a little bit the easy way out. Here in Israel, we tend to not go package deal like America, and we buy each item separately. Each item separately. Getting the Esro perhaps first, then the Lulav, and then closer to the Chag HaDasim, and the Arab, the Chag HaRobos, so they don't dry out. It's an incredible amount of detailed inspection, and the rules are strict, and the stakes are high, because one dot or one accident could ruin your precious mitzvah that you may have spent a profound amount of money on. On the other hand, we have the sukkah. The sukkah is the exact diametric opposite in the spirit of its halacha. In sukkah, we have many halacha Moshe Misenais. We have kabbalos from all the way back from ancient times that we can use various devices to solve visible gaps for example, if you put a board adjacent to a wall and it's seven tvachim long and the rest is a gaping hole, so you have like a caddy corner, we have one jinnit wall, and on the other side you have a seven tvachim board, which is, uh, if you say a tefach is, let's say, at most four inches, 28 inches is not a lot. I'm not sure what that's in, uh, in, uh, in millimeters, <laughs> but and then you imagine that the rest of the sukkah wall exists. And we also have this concept called dofen akuma. Dofen akuma means if you, if you have a portico, which means the cement is a wall, and the cement goes over the top a little bit, you can actually, up until four amos, use the cement portico to create a sukkah, well, with kosher svach, of course, on the rest of it. We call it a bent wall. That's a... That's a you know, an elaborate, uh, how should I elaborate, um, het, ki, ki ilu het there, that you don't need an actual schach exactly. It can, we can view it as bent over, it's good enough. And similarly, if we have a gap in the, in the schach, as long as it's not too big, right, then we are entitled to consider it lovud. 
three tvachim, anything within three, three tvachim is not considered a gap. But it is. It's right there. No. We allow it. How is it possible that the most strict mitzvah that we perhaps perform all year, Lola Venesra, is in the same holiday, the same Yom Tov, as one of the most lenient mitzvos in Jewish literature and lore and halacha, the sukkah. In fact, there's even discussions by Rabbi Kiva Eger whether you can couple two of the fictional true realities, such as the gap of Lavud and also the Dauphin Akuma together in one sukkah or in one place within the sukkah. That's how lenient we are. That's how accommodating we are. So it seems. So how can you explain this dramatic, dramatic contradiction? And I think the answer is very simple. We have to look to the psukim from which these mitzvot emanate. By Lul of we say, L'kachtem lachem by Yom HaRishon creates Hadana. The mitzvah of Lul of represents you. The, the lulav is your spinal column. It's your thinking. If there's the littlest crack there, if it's not unified, if there's sefekos, doubts, lack of cognition, lack of understanding, it's serious. Your lulav has to be intact. Your thinking has to be intact. You have to be a straight thinker. If your heart is your lulav, any small imperfection in your heart, you know, could be fatal. Same, same with the spinal column. We can't take those risks. And... Of course, that Dasim and Ravos, which represent our eyes, the Ravos, and the lips, what we see and what we say. The love is what we think. The Esog is what we feel. It's about us. Whereas the Sukkah is not about us as individuals at all. It says, Shivas Yomim Teshu Basukos. Seven days you sit in the Sukkah, right? And Everyone in Kla Yisrael is okay to sit the Sukkah Achas. Okay, we do not. Sukkah is the national grouping, right? Everybody, call Ezra Yisrael. Any citizen of Israel sits. You sits in the Sukkah. We it must. It must be a collective gathering place, ready, ready and able, in theory, to house the entire Jewish people. So here we have the answer. When it comes to evaluating ourselves, we can be very strict. We can demand constant improvement and performance. One should never sit on their laurels. Say, oh, I learned in yeshiva till I was 22 or 23 years old. And the rest of my life, I'm just going to try to maintain some sort of level close to what I was as a ben yeshiva. No, that's not a vibrant yahadus. It's certainly not in the spirit of Torah in any way, shape, or form, which is a time in the machazikim, but it's a growing tree. We have to constantly be improving ourselves. And we should be considering our, our performance every day. In fact, Rav Nachman, Abresov teaches an incredible thing. If you're willing to sit down with yourself for an hour a day, or even a half an hour, whatever you're going to call a period of time, and evaluate yourself for that brief period of time, saying, how did I do today? Could have, could have been a little bit nicer to that lady in the supermarket. I could have been more generous by giving a few extra coins to the person who was asking me for tzedakah. I could have been a little more courteous. I could have smiled. I could have been more sensitive in my words to my spouse, to my children. I could have represented Torah in a more dignified way as I went about my business. I could have been perhaps doing my work with greater integrity, concentration, and giving. That's always, there's always room for improvement every single year, every single day. And if you're going to be evaluating yourselves, then guess what happens? You're not evaluated above. The Bezdin Shalmala closes its books on you and says, hmm, there's somebody in charge of him. It's his own Seichel and Neshama are evaluating him. We do not need to judge him. Let me give you an incredible analogy. Everybody knows that one of the biggest themes this year in the whole sad episode of the Gaza war is the intervention of the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Of course, this is the august body of the righteous United Nations and European Union, the tzaddikim of the world, as they consider themselves giving, humble, honest, 
protecting the weak, giving millions and millions of dollars, $157 million, Kamala Harris and her partner Biden, well, she, she wrote the letter, they gave to Lebanon because Nebuchadnezzar, the poor Hezbollah, but when there's a hurricane, like we saw two massive hurricanes, they gave a hundred or two hundred million dollars total to vast, vast, vast populations across several states. How can you explain this? And when held to task, they are flustered. They have no answers. They fake and scramble and try to cover themselves. I'll tell you the reason they give the money to Lebanon because they don't want Israel to control Lebanon. They don't want Claudius Yisrael to defeat its enemies. They think in their, in their lack of comprehension or unwillingness to concede to the Malchus Shamayim, the truth, which is terrorists are terrorists and Habal Lahargo, Hashkim Lahargo. We have to be allowed to attack those that would attack us. But why the world doesn't get it? They just don't want to. They have their own perceptions. But when it so therefore, when it comes to that criminal court, they wanted to indict, of course, Israeli leaders. But Israel answered an interesting thing. They said, you know what? Your court is a safety net. The International Criminal Court is only relevant to countries that don't have their own legal system that's appropriate. Heaven knows that in Israel, the power and authority of the Supreme Court is vast. One great thing to report is that they did allow uh, Mechitza Minyan in Tel Aviv, unlike the mistake of last Rosh Hashanah, on this Yom Kippur, there's a Tikkun, there'll be a place designated in the city of the Tel Aviv against the wishes of many in the leadership of that city, which is a, a Makam Kadosh. It's Eretz Yisrael, it's filled with shuls and synagogues and people doing mitzvos, and yet the acknowledgement of Hashem's supreme rule on, on uh, uh, in terms of observing the holy days of the Torah, the Torah prescribes, was battled for reasons that were relevant only to some modern sensibilities which have questionable and dubious worth. But this year, the court ruled properly. Yes, there can be a place for that. There is a place for that. There must be a place for that. And therefore, since there is such a Supreme Court with so much power in Israel, argues Israel, you have no dis you have no jurisdiction over us, Mr. International Criminal Court in The Hague. You have no jurisdiction whatsoever. Because we have our own system. This is exactly where Nachman is teaching. If you have your own self-evaluation every day with love and with care and with carefulness, just like you check your rule of an estrogen, but in a loving way, in a sympathetic way, in a way which saying, ah, I want to do a little better, Hashem, because I love you. I want to do a little better for you because you deserve a better performance from me. I want to do it because I just want to be a better Jew. Because I just want to give my heart over to you, Hashem. I just want to give my thoughts over to you, Hashem. I just want to speak in a way that you would want me to speak. I want to look at the world in a kosher way, in every sense of the world. And that requires a lot of introspection and self-evaluation. But the good news is, if Hashem sees you doing it, in Shemayim, the books are you on you are closed. Whereas when it comes to the sukkah, Kol Ezrach Yisrael Yeshua Sukkah, every single Jew. When you want to bring all kinds of Jews together, of every persuasion, of every ilk, of every level of education, of every ethnicity, we have it all. From the most observant to the least observant, from the uh, various ethnicities with all sorts of different customs and hugging, levels of education, levels of, of, of dedication to the secular world, academics and science. You better make some accommodations. You better be willing to say, I'm going to look at my friends and I'm going to look at the glass half full and that's going to be okay. You want to look at yourself and be unhappy if the glass is half full, that's your business and your mitzvah. That's the Lubin Esra. But when you want to look at another Jew, we're not judge and jury over anyone. Only Hashem is. And who knows who Hashem values more? The, 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 the secular Jew who went out to save another Jew on that fateful day of October 7th or who sacrificed their life in defending 
our country since then? So many, so many have fallen. How do we know what the status in Ghanaian of that person is with where we stand as of now? And therefore, the dichotomy between the, the lulav and the sukkah is the difference between self-evaluation and looking at others. So we bring the lulav and esrog into the sukkah, and then we have balance. The Hasidic minhag is, is the bench of the lulav in the sukkah, as my father Zetzal taught me to do. Before you go to shul, or before you recite halal, take your lulav into the sukkah, then you have the full complement, the individual greatness and, and, and excellence and the tolerance and love of the tzibur. And that explains, I believe, the Maharil. The medaktakim represent the people of the Lulav and Esrog type. They're medaktek. They're looking for a dak. They're looking for a little dot. Those people should exit Yom, the Shul and Yom Kippur and go straight to a mitzvah because they want to stay on the path of holiness as much as possible. To the other part of Kuala Yisrael, to the Sukkot Yidin, we say to them gently and lovingly, Mitzvah by Deno Al Tach Mitzena. We know there's a little chametz going on. I know that you're not trying to be as medactic as 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 incredibly you, you could be, but just remember, don't let the chametz take over. We got through Yom Kippur. Now let's make sure that the momentum and the kabbalas of Yom Kippur are celebrated on Sukkot as well. I hope that this year. We will master these two things. The understanding that a little bit talking to Hashem and evaluating ourselves every day will protect us from harm. And the other thing that will protect us from harm, even perhaps more so, is to look at every single Jew with a kind eye, welcoming, warm, and unified. In this way, we combine the Lulav and the Esrog, the Sukkahs together, and we should see miracles this year, this Hoshana Rabbah, this Simchas Torah, where we rejoice, in the vanquishment of the, in vanquishing evil, not only in the outside world, but a little bit in our hearts as well. Have a great young. <laughs>